So this week we're talking about the Shaver mystery. In 1943, Richard Shaver wrote to Amazing Stories magazine and began a relationship. There are years worth of stories and artwork and it became known as the Shaver Mysteries. But what I want to read to you tonight is Mr. Shaver's account of how he learned about these, the things in his stories, these creatures, these beings, spirits, um, underground, dangerous, sometimes helpful. So we're, I want to read to you how it started for him because even though they are science fiction stories, Mr. Shaver always said that they were true. The night it all started, I was sitting alone in the darkness of the living room, the rest of the family having long since gone to bed. I was thinking deeply of Manfred, the narrative poem by Byron. I was mentally stimulated by the strange evidence my thoughtful analysis had given me that Byron was not, strictly speaking, writing fiction. I sensed that he was trying desperately to say that his subject was more factual than fictional, but that he could not say it outright because of some restriction, either of prejudice or actual danger. This suspicion of something true beneath the facade of Byron's word rhythm led me to an experimental try at uncovering whatever it was that Byron was talking about. However, I was sure that if I succeeded in calling up a spirit or a being, it would find itself facing one one mighty hard to convince young atheist. I made a mental effort, not in the least successful. As the night drew on, I grew impatient with such meandering, such a silly departure from sane normality. But Manfred, when I turned on the light and resumed my reading, said again and again, that the Witch of the Alps was no dream. It also said that Manfred was cursed. Thou canst never be alone. It seemed to me that if Byron was telling the truth, then none of us could ever be alone, really. It followed that Byron's beings could sense the thought of any person anywhere and would contact that person if they chose. I decided to make one more effort before turning in. I concentrated on a call to woman, the witch of the Alps, love. I couldn't decide what I was trying to call up. But nevertheless, I reached strongly towards something that, if Byron was true and not fiction, must be listening. Not with any thunderclap did an answer come. Just a lessening of the darkness, I had turned off the reading light again. A tiny spider of light gathered itself together in the ceiling's corner, swiftly wove a growing web of brightness about itself. Thus I described it then. Now I would say it was like a television screen coming into focus. But in those past years, TV was still a dream to the public and myself. Only some two or three feet below the ceiling, Yet this web of light had a depth and breadth vaster than the room, vaster than I could grasp, and in this step I saw a woman. What I saw impressed itself indelibly on my senses. It was of so vital, vivid, and personal nature that it seemed a multiplication of reality. I could feel the woman's sex, her mental beauty, as though I saw her form exactly as she wished me to see it. Or was it that the device by which I was now seeing her screened out the undesirable and conveyed only the desirable features? Anyway, she was there, transparent of form, yet more completely present than anyone I had ever encountered through the eye's unaided vision. She was neither young nor old, 
neither terrifically beautiful nor plain. She seemed humorously observant of me and my wonder toward her, mysteriously aware of and a little scornful of the fear that came and went in me like a wind through some terrible swinging door, a door that opened on vistas never trod by ordinary men. It was as though my thoughts and emotions were visible things to her. I felt my mind naked and exposed and no place to hide. But my fear was overridden. There was her presence, compelling, poised, sure. Admiration rose in me because of her own knowledge of her power, her complete self-possession, and, and strange calm. A sudden realization that I had succeeded swept through me, and this thought seemed to cause her a ripple of misgiving. She seemed suddenly to realize that she had made a mistake in answering my call. She peered into my thoughts for a long moment, making sure of my identity. Then she went. The light faded swiftly. There was nothing. I sat a long time, recovering my composure, for my concepts of the nature of life and of man's place on earth had been shaken. I knew too suddenly too overwhelmingly that everything I had always thought of as true was not necessarily so. I know now that everything I had always accepted as myth and fable and fairy tales, fool's whisperings of superstition, were instead the most important records of truth that existed. For I had seen similar appearances in drawings and those drawings had illustrated a child's fairy tale. She had promised nothing, had in truth said nothing, yet I had read much in the few swift thoughts I had caught passing across her mind. For one thing, I knew that her appearance had been a mistake. She had been expecting someone in the know, someone who belonged. I had caught that thought even as she disguised it to seem as if she knew all about me. I had caught one other thought. If my call had been in words instead of abstract thought without symbols, she would not have appeared. For the next few weeks, I spent a lot of time reorienting my thinking, adapting my viewpoints and attitudes toward life to fit this tremendous new fact that there was an important part of life which might even rule me and most men and about which I know nothing at all. I felt I had been misinformed by nearly every learned book I had read. I felt that the only books in which I had ever picked up the least inkling of this hidden side of life were those books not considered serious by any thinking mind about the only real information I had come from sources regarded by the ordinary educated mind as worthless, fictional, mystical, mythical, or worse. Gradually, I became aware that other things had changed for me. I was suddenly irritated by something, or should I say someone, in the background of my mind. There was a constant sly perception and reaction going on that was not my own thinking. There was a listening, a watching, a weighing of me. Some other mind was getting more and more familiar with mine. The most secret vistas of my youthful dreams were being calmly, ignorantly, and ruthlessly pawed over by a definitely intruding personality and the intrusion was strangely revolting and resented. I was conscious of both help and hindrance from this unseen yet tangible presence. I distinguished at last several personalities where before there had been nothing but a vague perception of the mental vagaries of another entity. The differences I realized now were because they were many, not one or a few. The help I received was a help that invigorated my thinking, made easier the hard and often dreary plugging of a student. 
My mind persisted on pursuing every avenue out of the darkness of my ignorance. Like all roads to wisdom, the door at the end of the path always opened on the same vista of total darkness. But like all young people, I was still innocent enough to hope that wisdom was possible, even for me. One has to grow old to know that wisdom is the greatest chimera of all. I was to live a long time before I understood why those doors opened on the identical vista of dismal nothingness, that black, uninviting stupidity. But now, in youthful optimism, I believed I was gathering true wisdom in large stores that would make of my life a wondrous something denied to men who could not tap this wonderful secret source. The hindrance I received was a vicious impulse toward leaving undone the most necessary task, toward slighting the best of my friends, toward forgetting the most sacred duties. The hindrance was a wicked, slothful, ill-intended lethargy that dragged its feet, pulling on my coattail every time I found a way toward love, friendship, better living, spoiling every little success, soiling every pleasure. I knew very well what this thing was doing to me, but I didn't know why. I didn't know how to counteract its work. I was very conscious of these two contending forces, distinctly opposed and each consisting of many individual personalities. I had no conception of the nature and location of these personalities then, but I gradually learned. Very slowly, I soaked up understanding of the true nature of the beings at which Byron had tried so desperately to hint. I repeat, I knew very well what they were doing to me, but I didn't understand why. This why eluded me as several years went by. Then my growing understanding was amplified by a horrible experience and brought me into the class of the accursed. And I understood quite swiftly why Byron had been so vague and yet so urgent. I understood now why and how my watchers had to justify their existence to their superiors and how in their reports they were apt to enlarge upon my efforts to perceive and understand them. For I was suddenly graduated from a nobody to a somebody very dangerous to them. And as it happened, I at first did not even see the connection. I didn't class as identical the identity of the new thing that happened to me. So horrible, different was it. That is why I must treat of it as an entirely different phase than this account of the first experience that came to me. Yet it must be understood that there was a logical progression and that the two seemingly unrelated events were actually identical. Either one was actually the beginning, but one led into the other in so unrelated a manner that I myself did not at first recognize that it was the initial hindrance grown to gigantic proportions. Looking back upon this time of blind groping after the elusive hidden life, it always strikes me as most revealing of their own blind natures. They who have so many devices to help their sight and understanding, and yet understand and see very little of the truth. For it was not until they began actively to trick and deceive me, to lie to me with endless honeyed, enticing, or threatening words, to show me weird, awful visual projections, to confuse me and revile and injure me, that I really began to understand the why of their nature, the wherefore of their peculiarly fixed and malevolent character. Their revealment of their methods revealed the why of their methods. They were merely doing the same as they had done for ages past. They were keeping the secret 
and woe unto anyone who learned of their clandestine existence. Their methods revealed also their tools, and those tools were nothing devised by modern man. Nothing in history, nothing in modern science, nothing very coherent even in the Bible or in any ancient manuscript to which I had access, told that tools like this had existed on earth since before the deluge. It was their own stupid acts that revealed to me their secret and their hiding place, their power and their weakness, their ancient insect-like instinctive pattern of inbred activity. It was their tools, those incredibly wonderful devices built by the race of man before the flood, in that ancient time completely forgotten by modern man, the golden age itself, that gave away their hiding place. For I reason, since the deluge had swept clean the earth, it was only beneath the earth that these wonderful tools and devices could have remained intact. It was this terrible knowledge of the existence of these tools that was hardest to accept. They were creatures capable of any cruelty, any degradation, any vileness, and they had the powers of the great ancient race itself. It was hardest of all to realize that such creatures could live out their lives in contact with the works of the ancient great of earth using their knowledge and their dwellings and their devices, looking at their writings and their records, and not be in the least ennobled by such contact. It was my understanding of this that brought down upon me their cruel regard that drove me to attempt flight. I knew from reading Sienkiewicz's account of the similar flight of an acolyte of the powerful Rosicrucian cult of medieval times who brought down their curse upon himself and who fled through Europe to escape, that it would be hopeless, but I had no choice. They had always caused flight, had always pursued, and that was the way it must be. When the horror began at the auto plant where I worked as a welder, I took a vacation from my job to try other surroundings for some mitigation of my sufferings. Thus began many years of running away, many years of desperate jumping from place to place. Between jumps and jobs, I spent endless sleepless hours in deep thought, trying to understand and anticipate to find a weak spot in their web. Sienkiewicz's novel showed me that in literature there might be many such accounts, and in one or more of them might be the key to escape. In the resultant search, I found an infinite number of references to precisely similar flights and weird pursuits. Sienkiewicz was not the first nor the last to find a plot in this mysterious curse. The Greeks had fled the invisible pursuit. The Egyptians had fled... Throughout their long history are endless references. Ancient Ur had known them. Forgotten cities and lost nations had left their tales of similar weird flights, poltergeist wreckages, invisible persecutors. There was a boundless supply of information about them if one dug for it. Gradually, the whole picture of what they had been in the past, what they were today, and what they would always be without change and without end, came crystal clear before my despairing eyes. I wove the terrible truth into my science fiction stories as footnotes, as background. Willy-nilly, I tried to give my hard-won information to my fellow men. But science fiction was not the best place for an exposition of this ancient parasite, this living relic from the days of greater horror upon earth. My writing was much misunderstood, that this race who has been given so much so early in history, before surface man had learned anew to shape metal into machines, should have been degraded and ruined by fortune's greatest gifts, was not acceptable to the hopeful young minds of the science fiction field. 
how the products of the greatest science ever to exist on earth should have made of its discovery such a puny, fantastically malevolent strain of human was not understandable to the devotees of science who see in science and mechanics only good. How could the possessors of so much yet be so utterly selfish with their possession through the long centuries of man's slow rise from darkest ignorance. The teenage science fiction reader with his limited school text history could not comprehend the possibility of their existence, let alone accept it. Neither did I expect acceptance. I only tried to tear away the ancient veil. A public raised to believe implicitly that our modern industrial chaos is the supreme culture of all time. Looked with unseeing eyes as I tried to lift that veil. I knew then I was not big enough, not wise enough to succeed where so many of the great of all time had failed. The veil remains and will remain. But for a few of us, it is permitted to see the hideous and ancient corruption that it hides, and in my own case, actually to live with it for a time. I felt that I needed an audience of scholars with a background of much reading in the classics and in ancient literature, able to appreciate the positive proofs of their identity and their present existence I was able to present. Even if I could find the proper place and time, readers of science fiction were not such scholars. Even so, the majority of the readers of the Shaver Mystery, as it came to be called, applauded, asked for more and better proof, in themselves a proof because of their content of parallel phenomena, agreeing with my interpretation of these everywhere concurrent phenomena. To write that they had been the little people, the power behind the witches and the demon cults, the motive power in the religious miracles, the spirits behind the oracles, the recipients and devourers of the sacrifices in the temples, the hoarders of wealth, of gifts to the gods. To say these things is one thing. To prove them is something else at this state. But there are many things that can be proved beyond, beyond the shadow of a doubt. And these assembled proofs constitute a powerful persuasion upon any mind, any open mind. To many, they provide conviction that all is not as it seems upon the fair green ball of earth. To me, struggling to find an opening out of the morass no longer just for myself, but now for all mankind. The flood of letters I received from other sufferers was a crushing blow, bringing hopeless despair. The caverns were not, I realize now, a located thing. They extended underneath every area of earth. The evidence of their activity and strength piled up until I could not help but conclude that there is no answer for present-day man. He cannot break their power over him, nor remedy the ills they visit upon him. He cannot get from them one secret of ancient wisdom, nor one great basic truth of scientific use, not consciously. Unconsciously, I think men must borrow from their knowledge of the ancient work, which would explain the modern age, its rapid invention and growth. The visits of the saucers bring with them for me fresh despair, for I see them as proof of the cavern's contact with space. Knowing the cave people, I know that if any of the visiting saucers were benevolent visitors bringing gifts and scientific knowledge to the surface people, they would be destroyed. To me, that explains the failure to contact our surface government, because those saucers that are not destroyed are our ancient enemies. If some would be our friends, those friends would be destroyed before they can free us from our ignorance, from our ancient unseen chains. The unseen world beneath our feet, malignant and horrible, is complete 
in its mastery of earth. And most horrible of all, it is a world of madmen. To impress this upon you, I will go back to the time of my employment in the auto plant and the shocking discovery I made when the voices began a new and at first unrecognized assault upon me and made my life a hell that ended in the caverns themselves. I will tell it to you as it happened to me, in actual dialogue and with all the tricks literary artistry I can employ. Perhaps that way you will be persuaded to read on to the end until you reach some glimmering of understanding and perhaps also gain some initiative from it that may result in at least a partial achievement of the purpose that is now most vital to me, no matter how hopeless I actually believe it to be. Even a little acquisition of the ancient lore for the benefit of modern man will be better than none at all. Richard S. Shaver The Tormenting Voices Hey, Joe Raditz, bring that dolly over here. I glanced up casually from my welding, then blinked in puzzlement as my eyes took in the area immediately surrounding me. The voice in my ear had come out of nowhere. No fellow worker in this Detroit auto plant was near enough for me, for his voice to be heard by me. What the devil, I muttered then shrugged in mystification and turned back to my work. The moment I snapped the switch on my spot welder, the voice came again. No damn well this rivet won't fit. Don't tell me I don't know a 9.30-second hole when I see one. The voice died away, and although I listened intently for a long moment, it didn't come again. The noon whistle blew, and I looked, and I knocked off. But I didn't get much kick out of eating my lunch. I kept thinking about hearing the voice when no one was around me. It's a funny thing. I wonder who Joe Raditz is, I mumbled. I downed the last of my coffee and put the thermos bottle back in the lid of my lunch kit. Then I got to my feet, hitched up my trousers, and went down to the timekeeper's cubby hole. Do me a favor, Clocky, I asked. Sure thing, he grinned. If it's anything I can do without getting off my fanny. It is. I just want to know if there's a Joe Raditz working on this shift and where he's located. Clocky turned around on his high stool, faced an index on the wall, and ran one finger down the, the row of cards that were inserted in the little slots. Raditz, uh, yeah, here it is. Sure, Joe Raditz is on this shift, works over in Section 20. That'd be down at the far end of the building. He's a riveter. Thanks, Clocky, I said, and walked away and walked back toward my section. I was frowning, and the information I had just heard was revolving in my head like a silly pinwheel getting nowhere. Section 20, I mumbled, stumbling over a barrel of, of bronze welding rods. How could I hear a guy talking over there? I thought of acoustics and pursed my lips. Yeah, maybe I could at that. They say there's a spot in the old Senate chambers in the Capitol building where even the faintest whisper can be heard from a spot 90 feet away. And most peculiarly can be heard at no other point. Acoustics is a funny thing. Just the way a building is built can carry sounds and direct them to points where they couldn't ordinarily be heard. Some caves are like that. You can hear a voice a mile away when it would be inaudible otherwise at 100 feet. Thinking about it that way took the mystery out of it, and I grinned. Takes a mighty little thing to make a guy think he's dopey, I said aloud. I reached my bench and sat down to wait 
for the whistle to begin work again. By the time it blew, I had forgotten all about Joe Raddatz and acoustics. At two o'clock, the voice came again. This time, it wasn't the voice of Joe Raddatz. It was a new voice, hoarse and gruff, and there were only two words he seemed to be able to fit together coherently. They aren't the kind I'd ordinarily repeat. A moment later, I heard other voices, voices of men all up and down the plant. And after an hour, I had learned two things. All of the voices came from the side of the plant on which I worked, from one end to the other. I couldn't hear them when I, ha when I laid my welding gun down. Somehow the two were connected. By nightfall, I had figured it out. The voices of men were those who were near or in contact with some machine attached to the wiring system on my side of the building. I couldn't hear any voices at all as long as I didn't have any physical contact with my spot welder. I think I breathed easier. After all, there was an explanation that I was perfectly willing and able to accept. The wire system and the machines connected to it were somehow acting in a, in a telephonic manner, picking up voices, transmitting them through the electrical circuit, and reproducing them in my gun when I turned the thing in that evening. I spoke to the stockroom supervisor. Pete, how about sending this in for a repair job? It's out of order. What's wrong with it? Give me a shock, I lied. I figured it was better to say that than to go through the rigmarole of that would be necessary to explain how I heard voices through it. And the possibility existed that he'd snort and say I was nuts and I wouldn't get a new gun and I wanted one. It's nerve wracking to have it's nerve wracking to have to act like a telephone receiver when you're supposed to be concentrating on your work. A new spot welder didn't do any good. The next day I heard the voices again. There was only one thing to do. I stuffed my ears with cotton and I still heard them. Now I began to get a little scared. I wasn't hearing these voices. I was thinking them. They were in my mind, soundless, inaudible, mental telepathy. Men about me, near and far, saying things, thinking things, and I could hear every spoken word and every most secret thought. I knew I was receiving the thoughts of some of those men because, for instance, I heard Sure, Mike, you're right about that. Right? If this guy's right, I'll eat his shirt. You're the boss. We'll do it your way. And nuts to you after you're down the line. I do as I damn please. For a foreman, you're the stupidest. Uh, no workman would talk to his foreman like that. I heard other things that were more convincing proof that I was hearing thoughts. Things that made me blush when I heard them. And I don't blush easy. Right now, for instance, a guy was thinking about his girl. Say, if she thinks he loves her, somebody ought to put her straight. He's the wrong guy. But really, I ought to tip her off. Hey, wait a minute. How would I prove the truth of my tip? Dynamite, that's what this is. I'll have to keep my trap shut or I'll be, I'll have to keep my trap shut or I'll be known or I'll be putting my foot into it. 
I never realized how bad it might be to know what the other guy is thinking about without him being aware, you know. <clears throat> Put him on the rack, said a voice. I snapped off my welder and sat still, frowning. Something was wrong with that voice, or thought, or whatever it was. Put him on the rack. You don't put people in a rack in an auto plant. Tools, yes. A lot of other things. Rack? What sort of rack? It'll pull him apart in an hour, the voice went on, with a note of horrible satisfaction in it. Nice and slow, so he suffers plenty. Put the Ben Ray on him and he won't die too quick. My welding gun clattered to the cement floor. I stood as though frozen. The hair on my head crawled. What was I hearing? The voice was gone. All around me was only the muted roaring of the auto factory, the clanging, clattering, mingling maelstrom of busy machines and busier men. Just noise, new voices. What was going on? That voice had been no voice or thought of a worker in this plant. Unless, unless it was the thought of a madman. A madman. I sat down white and shaken as, as the thought struck me. Maybe I was mad. Maybe there were no voices at all. Maybe I never actually heard the voice of anyone else. Maybe my own mind was cracking up and inflicting these weird illusions upon me. But no, after all, there was Joe Raditz. I had heard the name correctly, and he actually worked here. And there were other men in the plant whom, I, whom I'd identified since. Somehow I had heard voices and real thoughts. Or was that insanity? Did insane people go insane simply because their brain functioned too well? In it, is an insane person only a person whose brain is more active than it should be? Is he using that nine-tenths of his brain that science says is just dormant and waiting for his future evolution into a higher type of creature. Just what is insanity after all? They put people who hear voices in the nut house. But maybe they do hear voices. Maybe they aren't insane at all. Maybe they are just like me. I looked at the gun again. A thought struck me. If I'm nuts, then I'd be nuts without a gun in my hand. I'd hear these voices any time, maybe all the time. Pick up the gun and see. I picked up the gun and watched it shake from the trembling of my hands. The horrible scream of agony that echoed in my brain jolted me right up to my feet with a gasp. And with a cry of terror, I hurled the gun from me and ran. Though my mind, through my mind, echoed that sense of utter pain, the scream of a human being in such torture as might be imagined only in Dante's Inferno. Somewhere, somehow, a human being was dying in a slow agony, and I was hearing him die. I couldn't take any more. I managed to slow to a rapid walk, but I kept on going until I got to Clocky's cage. Punch in my time, Clocky, I gasped. I'm quitting. I've had enough of welding. I finished weakly. Clocky stared at me peculiarly, then grunted, punched my card, and handed it to me. You can get your check in the office, he said gruffly. Sorry to see you go, Dick. He looked at me queerly. Say, you ain't sick, are you? No, n no, I said hastily. I'm okay. I just decided I don't like welding. Besides, I want to take a vacation for a while.
I've been working too hard, maybe. Guess that's why you think I look sick. I mumbled the last words and walked away. I didn't look back. Why should I? The one, one thing was sure. I had seen the last I was going to see of that damned welding gun. If I wasn't nuts, that gun would make me so sooner or later. A half hour later, I was out of the plant on a streetcar headed for the for home. His hotel is clear enough, said a voice. He dug up a lot of stuff and he's getting too smart. I, Richard Shaver, was going insane. I was sure of it now. I sat there in the streetcar with the awfulest feeling of fear I have ever experienced, listening to the absolutely crazy babblings of my own mind. How could it be anything else? Even if this were mental telepathy, how could I tie such a phenomena with the thing I heard, things I heard? They didn't make sense. Even insane people make sense. And this last voice in my mind... His hotels cleared through? What does that mean? He's dug the cellar out of his house, clear down to the caves, the voice explained. The voice in my head had answered my question. I sat as though I'd been struck by lightning, but I still had some sense left in my head. I gasped out another question this time audibly, and the man next to me turned to stare at me blankly. How deep is that? was what I asked. About 300 feet, said the voice, and suddenly there was a startled note in it, and it faded away. At the same time, I felt a numbing shock in my neck and in my spinal column. And I almost screamed with agony from the blinding headache that sprang into being. Say, mister, said the man next to me. You'd better get home to bed. You look sick. You look sick. I stared at him through pain-filled eyes. Yeah, I gasped. I, I had better. I am sick. Got a terrible headache. I climbed to my feet and struggled to the rear of the car and got off. I walked the rest of the way to my room, fighting the blinding pain in my head. I, bar I barely made it to bed before I blacked out. And as I blacked out, I knew a faint glimmering of truth. Somehow, by some weird super scientific means, unseen beings had caused this headache. Possibly the same once I'd heard talking that weird gibberish about the hotel and that I'd brought it upon myself by asking questions. I'd revealed the fact that I'd been listening and it hadn't been a welcome discovery. The pain-filled blackness into which I sink now was proof of that.